Uh, it's my it's my turn to present uh, the speaker. The speaker today is uh, Sergio uh, Sergio Toledo. Uh, he's an, he studied uh, telecommunication engineering at the uh, Polytechnic University of Barcelona, and then he uh, he made his PhD um, here at the University of Granada. Uh, his PhD was about uh, yeah uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, in particular in the ELF and VLF bands. And for example, he investigated how uh, uh, lightning excites the Earth ionosphere uh, cavity. Then after that, he, he went for a postdoc at the Swedish Institute of uh, Space Physics in Uppsala, where he more or less changed uh, a bit the, the topic and he investigated uh, magnetic reconnection, in particular using the observation of the cluster um, space, uh, spacecraft. Uh, then afterward, he did a second PhD, uh, postdoc, sorry, uh, at the European Space Agency in in Madrid, in ESAC, ESA, and uh, also about uh, magnetic reconnection. And today, he will give us an overview of uh, uh, his uh, studies and. In particular, he will talk about uh, yeah, magnetic reconnection at the magnetopause uh, boundary layer. Uh, so I just uh, let him start speaking. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, thank you very really much, Alejandro, for inviting me here and giving me this opportunity to, to present my work here. And thanks, everybody, for, for coming here and, and sharing your time with me and spending this time, this hour, with, with this presentation. So the title is called Plasma and Magnetic Reconnection of the Multipole Boundary Layer. I, I've been told that probably most of the people here will not be very familiar with this kind of study, so I will devote a big part of, uh, of it for, for general introduction. So we will slowly go through what is I mean by called plasma, what I mean by magnetic reconnection, what is the magnetopause boundary layer. We will visit all these concepts, and then at the end I will present my, my own work. This work has been done in collaboration with several people from several institutions. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention at least the people from the Swedish Institute of Space Physics where I initiated this topic. People currently working at the European Space Agency with me and also collaborators from both from Toulouse and Paris in, in France which help a lot uh, mainly with simulation part but also with observations. So I had one slide for, for introducing who was who, who, uh, introducing myself. But Alejandro already did it, so I guess that we can more or less skip it. Uh, as I said, just uh, that currently at the European Space Agency after a postdoc in Sweden, and that I got my PhD here in the city in Granada in the university. So my first slide is going to be about the Earth's magnetosphere. I'm going to give uh, just an overview just to start settling uh, what kind of study I'm going to present today. So this is uh, an artist's conception, a cartoon of the Earth's magnetosphere. The Earth's magnetosphere is it's kind of a bubble or, or a shield uh, that is uh, embedded inside the interplanetary magnetic field. So the solar wind, you can see it here, depicted in light blue, uh, it's, um, it's surrounding this bubble of the, this magnetosphere, and the magnetosphere is the region, is defined as the region where the Earth's type polar magnetic field can shield and can prevent uh, all this plasma from the solar wind to enter, to penetrate, and and uh, yeah, so the interaction is much more complicated. In particular, the interaction between the solar wind and the magnetosphere occurs mainly at what we call the magnetopause boundary layer, which is this region here, which is basically the interface between the solar wind and the, and the magnetosphere. Okay, we can see another interface here. This is the bow shock. So this is where the, um, where the flow starts to, to fill the magnetosphere. So we have a shock here, which is created. This region is called the magnetosphere, but it's still a... Uh, created uh, mainly from the solar wind and then here is where where the plasma cannot uh, really uh, penetrate anymore because of different magnetic fields independent magnetic fields and then the solar wind drapes around the magnetosphere and the magnetosphere can uh, maintain its internal um, its internal conditions of course there are interactions that's what uh, we're going to talk but they are not simple they are not really it's uh, very different like for instance with mars in mars we don't have a uh, polar magnetic field so basically the solar wind can erode and can wipe out any magnetosphere or ionosphere that can be there. It's much more difficult to sustain uh, plasma there, while the magnetosphere has a, has a much more uh, rich environment in that sense. You can see also it's very asymmetric, the tail region and the day side. The day side is compressed, of course, because of the interaction of the solar wind, while the magnetotail is elongated thanks to the shielding of the magnetosphere. 
color coded here is also uh, the, the more darker the picture is, it means that the more denser the region is. So you can see that there are many different uh, regions with different names, different colors, but I'm not going to cover all of them, of course. In fact, I'm going to be concentrating here when magnetic reconnection occurs, and then the, the, the planetary magnetic field, the solar wind, sorry, and the magnetosphere can interact. So this is an artist's conception of what I will be talking today about. You can see as just what I told, we have the magnetosphere, this shield protection, and with the, its internal plasma here, and then the solar wind uh, just blowing. It's blowing, of course, in all directions, but uh, here they enhance this region. And then that some mechanisms can bring this outside plasma inside, and so there, there is some exchange of energy and mass. There are two main mechanisms uh, nowadays that we believe that are responsible for this interaction for between the between the solar wind and the magnetosphere, so interchange of plasma and energy. One of them that is not going to be discussed today is the Kelvin Hancock instability. So this instability is uh, very famous for being uh, responsible for producing the waves on the ocean, for instance, or also you can see also in the in the clouds. So basically, you can when you have uh, two flows with different shear velocity you start uh, excitating this instability, you create these vortices, and this can lead uh, to mixing of the, two, of the two fluids. In this case, it's a bit more complicated because it's plasma, so you, you need to have into account the magnetic fields and the electric fields, but this can lead into an effective um, uh, intermixing of uh, energy and mass. But uh, anyway, and this happens mainly in the flanks because you need instability to develop. So you have the solar wind impinging into the magnetosphere, draping around, and then at some point you create these instabilities and you can mix the plasma. Uh, in, in any case, it's believed that uh, the dominant one is magnetic reconnection, not the helping help, although you have to think in both if you, have to, if you want to make this kind of studies of space weather when you want to understand the conditions of the sun, how it's going to affect the magnetosphere, how it's going to affect your environment where your satellites are lying, uh, you need to understand both. Although this is uh, more, uh, probably more important. This is small animation just to illustrate magnetic reconnection. So what we can see here is the Earth's dipole. You can see the magneto tail and the day set region. And we will see now the solar wind impacting. So we have the solar wind, which is compressing the day side. And at some point, by some reason, the magnetic fields can reconnect. So the magnetic fields from the solar wind get, get uh, reconnected to the Earth's one. Then this will move towards the tail, all these magnetic field lines, they will accumulate energy, you will be accumulating magnetic field energy, and at some point you get tail reconnection again, when this is responsible for creating the auroras. This is just one of the, of the side effects of all this dangue cycle of this mechanism where you, when you are, uh, when you are uh, introducing uh, mass and energy from the solar wind into the, into the Earth's magnetosphere system. So as we've seen in this uh, movie, there are two main regions where you can have uh, reconnection. So for having magnetic reconnection, you need some sort of anti-parallel magnetic fields, like this configuration when you have a southward interplanetary magnetic field, and then you have the northward um, dipole magnetic field here. So it's, this is um, favoring, favoring magnetic reconnection, as we will see. And again, uh, in the tail, we, you can have this configuration of anti-parallel magnetic fields, and you can release this uh, form of energy. So the idea is that we can use the, the Earth's magnetosphere as a natural laboratory for better understanding this fundamental plasma process. This fundamental plasma process uh, can occur, well, we'll see that later. So, but uh, in my work, I'm gonna be concentrating on magnetic reconnection occurring here, observation of magnetic reconnection from spacecraft. So this is other sketches to better understand what is magnetic reconnection. You can see the anti-parallel configuration of the two magnetic fields, and at some region, the two magnetic fields, uh, the two uh, plasmas, independent plasmas, are colliding, like in the case with the solar wind and the magnetosphere, where the solar wind is pushing. And then what you're doing, uh, when you have this anti-parallel configuration, uh, by the Carl of B, by the Maxwell's laws, you are having, a, you are creating a current. So as soon as you are compressing these magnetic fields, you are increasing the, the energy stored in the magnetic fields, and you are creating a current out of plane. So at some point, this thing becomes unstable, and all this loading uh, can, can lead to reconnection, where you suddenly explode, and you, you relax the magnetic field configuration, and you create a lot of kinetic energy to the particles. So you create two exhaust, two jets, where you are really uh, accelerating plasma, creating uh, energetic particles, and, and so on. This is a sim uh, two-dimensional simulation of magnetic reconnection. That's a bit more or less what we've seen. This is uh, 
uh, oh, was a cartoon. This is a real simulation from a particle in cell code. So you can see the magnetic fields lines, the magnetic field lines, how they are merging, and how the and in color code you can see the density, the density of the plasma, and you can see how this plasma is expelled into two, the two jets, the two source. So this this would be the magnetosphere side, the solar wind side, and you can see how do you create these two jets. This is another plot of the same simulation, another video where we will see the magnetic field configuration of the plane. This is just to illustrate uh, again that uh, the process is complex, so you can see that you are creating slowly a quadrupolar structure here. This is a typical signature of magnetic reconnection. This is the out-of-plane magnetic field in core. And you can see how this magnetic field is frozen into the plasma and it's being ejected together with the, with the, with the particles. This, well, this simulation, uh, this is courtesy of uh, the people at the Laboratory of uh, Plasma Physics in Paris. Simulation uh, was run during 220 hours in, in 512 cores, and the output size was uh, around five terabytes, so it's, it's huge simulations. So I didn't mention it, but um, to better understand reconnection, our current understanding of reconnection leads us to that we have to better understand how reconnection initiates. So you have these two fields which are anti-parallel, and at some point in a very small region, you have some conditions that allow the magnetic field to diffuse and then suddenly to change the, to change the, the configuration. This, is, this occurs at the smallest scales of the plasma, the kinetic scales, and to understand it, you have to go down to the electron scale. So here we have depicted the, what we call the diffusion region that we plot into these in two dimensions like a box. So here would be one of your plasmas, here the other of your plasmas. And this larger box represents the ion scale. So below, inside this box, below this region, the ions are not frozen in anymore because they, are, they cannot complete their generation. They are not magnetized anymore. And they start doing things uh, different than the electrons. So this difference of motion, of course, will create currents. And uh, this is a very rich current region, as you can see with all these, uh, all these arrows uh, out of plane and parallel as well. And then you have a much smaller box, which is the electron diffusion region, which is where the electrons also get demagnetized. So, and is the current uh, studies are trying to understand this electron diffusion region. The problem is that this electron diffusion region in space in the magnetosphere is of the order of the size of a few kilometers. So, how do you put the spacecraft there? You don't, we don't know where this region is. I mean, this thing is not happening all the time. Uh, magnetic reconnection is continuously moving in the interface between the solar wind and the and the magnetosphere, so it's very, very difficult to catch. Now we have a mission for two years from NASA trying to catch it, and I think we've spent in two years two, three, four seconds in what we believe it's maybe this region. So it's really, really difficult to, to observe. There have been also measurements uh, in laboratories, but the problem in laboratories is that the scales are much, much, much uh, smaller. You can, I mean, in space, you can put a spacecraft and you're basically not doing anything to reconnection. But if you try to do that in a laboratory, you will be changing the, you cannot put a probe there where you can measure without affecting the plasma. So it's a problem of scales, as we can see here, the electron scales, the ion scales. This is just for motivation, this is live, just I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to show other places where reconnection occurs. So we're studying reconnection in the Earth's magnetosphere because it's a good laboratory for us for better understanding it. But um, there are many other regions where we can, uh, where we can have reconnection. Like for instance, it's well known that it, it, they are responsible for coronal mass ejections. And uh, they happen and they occur in the solar corona, so the reconfigurations of magnetic fields in the solar corona produce uh, eruptions of uh, plasma, which uh, they are afterwards are named coronal mass ejections. Uh, it's also a problem in fusion reactors. In fusion reactors, we have plasma very well confined, and you try to increase, increase, increase the magnetic fields to get your reaction to work, and then magnetic reconnection spontaneously arises and prevents the, um, the reaction to occur. So it's something we need to better understand in order to avoid it to occur in, in total mass. That's a very well-known problem. And then in, in much more uh, exotic objects in the, in the universe, uh, magnetic reconnection has been uh, pointed as a possible uh, mechanism for when, basically when we see relativistic particles or very large jets or exhausts. And if we believe that magnetic fields can be there, so like for instance in the creation of this in galaxy lobes, magnetic reconnection has been proposed as a possible um, explanation for that effect, for this effect. 
So I will switch into the missions now. This is the two missions that I've been working. They are not the only missions that are available to study magnetic recognition, but these are the two ones that I've been working with and are the two ones that I selected to present here. One is from the European Space Agency cluster. The other one is from NASA, from yeah, MMS from NASA. So both of them are made of a constellation of four probes. So we have four spacecraft flying in the Trident formation. This is because we want to disentangle uh, spatial variations from time variations. So you have your spacecraft there, and then your magnetic recognition set is just quickly passing. And you want to know that the changes that you observe, if they are because just of time evolution, or it's just because the thing is moving. So in order to do that in 3D, you need a minimum of four spacecraft. That's why they, they use both the spacecraft, they use four spacecraft. And basically, they are, compre they are comprised by a suite of, um, of uh, measurements, so of instruments that can measure the fields, the electric and magnetic fields, and the particles, both the ions and the electrons. Cluster was launched in 2000, 17 years ago. It had a polar orbit, so it could uh, sample many different regions of the magnetosphere. It, uh, it was a multipurpose, it has been a multipurpose mission, so Cluster was not launched just to study magnetic recognition, but the magnetosphere in general. So the Tetrahedron has been uh, working at different scales, so they wanted to resolve both electron scales, ion scales, so the size of the Tetrahedron, I think it went down to a few tens of kilometers, and sometimes well, like several thousands of kilometers, depending on the problem and, and the physics they wanted to study. And as I said, uh, it was uh, using multiple regions. It was sampling multiple regions of the magnetosphere. And the particle resolution that they could achieve, particle resolution means uh, every, so what is your rate of having a full sky map of the particles? So you want to know how many particles, how many ages, how many electrons are coming from each of the directions. So they could achieve that thanks to the spinning of the spacecraft. So the, basically the detector was looking at one side and thanks to the spinning of the spacecraft we have a full coverage after one spin, which was four seconds. While in MMS, the differences are, I mean, there are many similarities as you will see, but there are many differences as well. First of all, it's a much more new mission. It's 15 years later, so the instruments are much better. The orbit has, is equatorial. They have, uh, they have optimized the orbit uh, to maximize the time that you spend in the regions where reconnection may be occurring because it's a mission intended for magnetic reconnection, both at the day side and the tail, but only magnetic reconnection. That's really, really the main topic of MMS. And the particle record solution, you can see that it's been very, very, very improved. So it's around two orders of magnitude for electrons. So where we used to have a one dot before, now we have 100 dots. So we can, we can really, really go down to the electron scales now with this new mission. This is just a photography of the cluster mission. You can see the four spacecraft while they were being assembled and tested. And you can see that they are complex. Well, they are spin stabilized spacecraft. So you can see the, the cylindrical shape with the solar panels that uh, are able to, to receive energy all the time. Several instruments of board that have been contributed by many different, uh, many different institutions in Europe and all over the world, in fact. This is the orbit of a uh, cluster, so you can see during winter and during summer, you can be sampling either the day side or the, or the tail side. Uh, it makes it also to the solar wind, so there was uh, the instrument where solar wind capabilities as well. You sample the magnetosheet, you sample the cast, you, said you can sample many regions, and they were slowly changing the orbit also to be able to sample uh, other regions. So, uh, in all these uh, years of mission, it's still going on a uh, cluster, it's an alive mission, it's still getting data. After 17 years, it's, uh, it's been a very, very successful mission in, in space science, space physics. And this is the newest mission, this is the MMS. This is from NASA, launched two years ago from Florida. So you can see the four spacecraft assembled. You can see that they really remind the cluster ones. I mean, they really, really, uh, use many contents from the from the class mission, although uh, although the spacecraft are are much uh, much much up to date, of course. Uh, what else to say from here? Well, the, the cost of this mission, if I remember correctly, it's uh, around one billion euros. So it's a really it's a, it's a large mission. It's, it's not a small mission. I mean, NASA really invested uh, quite a good part of of budget uh, for doing this mission. And you can see here in the schematics of uh, one of the MMS spacecraft. So this was just basically to illustrate the amount of uh, different instruments that they are on board. Of course, with different PIs, with different teams all over the world. So it's, it's, it's a big community. It's a very large community of people 
there are many contributions from Europe, uh, from Sweden, from Austria, from France, There's collaborations from Japan as well, and many instruments have been cited in the United States as well. And so this is to explain a little bit of the, of the orbit of MMS. As I said, it's equatorial, so basically the orbit is lying, so cluster was with an orbit, a polar orbit, while uh, the orbit of, uh, of MMS is in the equatorial plane. You can see it here, this is a view from the top, so the North Pole is here. And for MMS, uh, up to now, in the prime phase mission, there is mainly two, uh, two phases. First phase, phase one, which, are we, which is ended now. Now we are moving towards phase two. Um, the nominal distance of the, the, the equatorial orbit was a uh, 12 uh, Earth radian. So it's a very elliptic orbit of one day. And this, uh, this orbit was maximized to spend the maximum amount of time in where we believe that the magnetopause can be found. Of course, this magnetopause is moving. It really depends on solar wind pressure and many other parameters. It's all the time. So there are some orbits where we don't catch it at all, and there are some orbits where we just catch it for a few moments. But it was decided that this uh, was the best. Uh, so we spent two years doing this orbit, do doing this uh, kind of orbit, and now we are increasing slowly this orbit during all this time in the flank. And if I remember correctly, they want to make it 40 RU. I'm not sure about this number. I think it's I think it's 30, 40. The place where they, they want to reach. And this is intended for uh, being able to catch this region of interest that I need to take. So now for the next two years, we will have this large orbit and we will try to, to sample the, this region here. And I wanted to mention this uh, concept, the scientist in the loop. Uh, I believe MMS is the first mission to do that. I'm not completely sure, but I really think it's the, they introduced this concept. I'm aware that other missions are now going to take it, like for instance, the Tor mission, and I believe the Solar Orbiter mission may be using this kind of concept as well. So the problem that uh, we face with MMS is that uh, we have four spacecraft producing very high rates of data, so they're 30 milliseconds, for, and it's, it's huge amounts of data, and we are not able to download everything. We can, basically, it's not possible to get all the data and run because it's too expensive. Yeah, the price for having the antennas pointing at your and you have to share with other species, and it's really, really expensive to get uh, this data download. So that was not possible. So the approach was to, first of all, to define two regions. So the first region is the region of interest, where we believe a priori that we may have important uh, information. So during this time, all the instruments are switched into burst mode, so you are getting high rates on board of the spacecraft. And at the same time, you are getting what we call the fast survey, which is a much more low resolution of the data. Then when you are out of the region of interest, which is basically, it's, uh, basically defined only by the distance, I think as, as soon as you are farther than eight Earth radia, then you are in the region of interest. So you may have chances of observing this reconnection. And, and then when you are out of the region of interest, you get really the low, low data sampling. But the thing is that you don't download all these bars data. You, you don't have, we don't have a bandwidth for downloading. So what we will do is we will download only this fast survey data, and then there will be the scientist in the loop, which is a human person, that every day and every orbit will check, the, will check this data. So the kind of data that they will get every day is, OK, this is, uh, I don't, I'm not going to explain all these panels now, but this is just for you to get a taste from different instruments. You will get electric, magnetic fields, particle densities, energies, etc. This is a 12 hours interval, so, and you can have more zoom. I mean, the resolution is better than this plot, in, even in the fast target. But the, so this person will have a time window of approximately 24 hours to decide which, which portions of data are worth to download. So these are his selections. So here you can see he's giving uh, scores, figures of merit, and deciding, okay, I think that this is interesting, this chunk of data up to value whatever. And this is much more interesting. And this is an algorithm that is on board that also the, the selects by default the possible interesting places too. But you can see that the human, I mean, there is a lot of human interaction needed here. You cannot really do it based on algorithms. It's very hard that the spacecraft by itself will detect what are the good intervals, or at least the human will, will have many times different uh, options. It's a, I wouldn't say it's stressing, but it's a responsibility to take. So basically, this is on a week basis. So for that week, you know that every day you will get the data, and you have 24 hours to tell back what, uh, what uh, chunks of data you think are important. Doesn't mean that you will get them down, but you are giving scores, and then more, the higher the score, the more chances that this data will be downloaded. And of course, all the other data is lost. It's overwritten by, by the spacecraft again in the next iteration.
Uh, this slide is uh, for cold plasma. In my title, if you remember, there was also the, the concept of cold plasma. So now I'm gonna, well, cold plasma has been overlooked for many times uh, because it was some kind of a hidden population. The problem with cold plasma, when I say cold, I say of energies of the order of tens of EB. So you have uh, ions that are basically standing there. They are not really, they don't have much thermal energy. They come from the ionosphere and they populate the whole magnetosphere as we will see. And so this is, uh, this is the spacecraft. The spacecraft, due to photoemission, because they receive uh, solar illumination, they are usually uh, charged to several tens of volts. So basically, they deflect. The potential of the spacecraft deflects all this cold plasma. So you cannot, really, you cannot really see them by the particle detector easily, because they never reach the detector. So there have been several methods, like this one here, taking advantage of the so this situation will create a wake, as you can see here. So you will have a region of rarefied ions where you will have uh, more electrons. And this can be measured by the electric field instrument. The tips of these uh, wires, the, so the spacecraft you saw is uh, more or less the size of a human. But these uh, wires for the electric field measurements are of the order of 50 meters. So each spacecraft has a 50 meter wire, which is keeping it stands just thanks to the spinning. And then this allows you to measure these wakes when they are formed. So this is an, inter an indirect way of detecting that you have cold plasma. It's not the only way. There are some times where you can measure them. They are limitless. But this is just to show the difficulty of uh, cold plasma measurements. So based on the technique that I just explained, in 2012, uh, Andrea and others could draw maps of all the magnetosphere using 12 years of cluster data. And they came to show that it was very, very, very normal to find cold plasma in many regions of this mag on the magnetosphere. You could see it also in the, in the reconnection region. So 70% of the time, 57% of the time, 20. These are different mechanisms that will bring this ionospheric plasma into different regions of the magnetosphere. And this I put it for historical reasons. I believe this is one of the first, if not the first, map of what they call thermal ions that now we call cold ions occurring. So you could see that they are skimmed towards the dust side. It's more common to find them on the dust side than in the day side. But uh, as you can see, they, they can be very abundant. So the question that we have is, what is this cold plasma doing to reconnection? When, when we have the situation of this cold plasma plume, this uh, cold plasma material from the ionosphere reaching the magnetopause, how is it going to affect the interaction with the solar wind? That was the question I've been working for the last years. So the first thing that uh, this cold plasma can do, it's so this is a cartoon where you can see, so you can see the cold plasma populating the plasma sphere, and then a mechanism which we call the plume situation, which due to convection can bring this cold material into the magnetopause, into the reconnection region. So this was a good example by Walsh in 2014, where he had one spacecraft out of the plume and one spacecraft inside the plume, so he could compare ongoing reconnection in the two cases. So what we found, what he found, is that it, it could be expected that the advent velocity, the advent velocity is an uh, intrinsic velocity of a plasma, and it's, uh, it corresponds to the velocity at which the plasma is ejected in this exhaust that we were talking about, about magnetic reconnection. So he could find that due to, and this is the definition of the advent velocity, so if you increase the mass of the plasma, you are decreasing the advent velocity directly. So the direct effect of reducing this, uh, reducing this advent velocity is that you slow the reconnection rate. The amount of magnetic flux that you can reconnect gets down. So if you have this cold line reaching there, suddenly the, you kind of slow down this process. This was shown with this case study and also from a statistical by statistics, by uh, doing many, many, many cases inside and outside, and then he could show that when you had cold ions, the advent velocity on average was much smaller than when you didn't have the, the cold ions. So that was the first effect that uh, that one has to think when when we have this plasma. But in addition to this mass loading effect, this is just because the cold ions are massive, but it's not because they are cold. I mean, they could be hot and they would be doing the same thing because they have the same mass. But then we have this idea, this is what I started doing when I moved to Sweden, that the cold ions uh, could introduce a new landscape. The cold ions have a much smaller gyro radius. So imagine here in this cartoon, if you have a region with a vertical magnetic field, the hot ions will have a large gyro radius due to their own, uh, their own uh, perpendicular velocity. So they will be directing doing, and this is an estimation for the magnetosphere, around 400 kilometers. Well, the cold ions is roughly one order of magnitude smaller gyro radius, and the electrons is even one 
these are the two scales that I was showing in, this, in, the, in the boxes, no? where we could see the ion diffusion region and the electron diffusion region. So we were thinking, okay, that the cold ions could behave like electrons, could remain magnetized, could remain gyrating inside the structures where the hot ions are not allowed anymore. So we thought directly uh, in this uh, whole region, so this is uh, an electric field uh, plot. So reconnection sets a narrow boundary, what we call the whole electric field, which is governed by the size of the hot ion gyro radius. As we can see here, you have an enhancement of electric field between these two walls, and this size is governed by the hot ion gyro radius. So the cold ions can drift inside here. We had this idea, and we could prove it with clusters. So we used cluster data, and we showed that 12 uh, different uh, independent cases where we could see that these cold ions were doing effectively what we were thinking. So they remained magnetized inside these small narrow regions of enhanced. So you have electric field here, an enhancement which corresponds to this region in the simulation. So basically the spacecraft was crossing this region here. And we tried to estimate the different terms in the Ohm's law that provide the balance to this electric field. And we found that in order to explain the observations, you have to, to split this frozen in term. The V cross V term of the plasma has to be split into a cold ion term and hot ion term because the frozen in condition was met for the cold ions but not for the hot ions anymore. So they were introducing an intermediate scale where they could introduce new physics and uh, this was uh, directly affecting the, the other term. So they were taking uh, part of the um, electric field from this uh, J cross V term, so they were reducing the currents, the perpendicular currents. And yeah, that this was uh, the result of this, of this study in, in 2015. So based on these results, we thought, so hold on, so what happens in the diffusion region? We will have to have a similar situation. So we have cold ions that have the ability of remaining frozen in to smaller scales than the, than the hot ions, of course not as small as the electrons. But we had this idea in mind, and then we used MMS data to try to check that, and, and we managed. So this is a recent study that I did uh, last year. This is an overview of an MMS crossing. So this is the kind of data we, kind, uh, we get from MMS. Here you can see the magnetic field, the density of the particles, the velocity of the plasma, the ion energy, so here you have energy, and color code is the amount of differential energy flux. So basically this is cold, this is hot on the top. And this is the same for electrons. So you can see different regions here. We are in a different region than here and here and here. So this is the magnetosphere. Uh, this is the solar wind. This is an intermediate region that we identified as an ion diffusion region, and this is back to the, to the solar wind. So if you sketch the orbit, of the spacecraft is something like that, more or less, with the three crossings identified here. The spacecraft is, is static. I mean, the spacecraft is really not moving. It's really moving very, very, very slow at, at this large part of the of the of the of the orbit. But but the background, the, the magnetic reconnection site, is really moving. This is what is moving fast, and this is what creates this strange orbit that is sometimes is difficult to interpret exactly where you were at, at which point. Uh, you can see here a magnetic field rotation in the Z component. So this is the transition from northward to southward magnetic field. So this is the curl of V which creates your, uh, this is the rotation of magnetic field which creates the current. So this is a good situation for, for reconnection because you have an anti-parallel magnetic field. You can see the density increases from the typical of the magneto sheet and down here. And the interesting of this, the interest for us of this event were two things. One is that you have cold plasma, you have these cold ions here that can be directly observed because they are being accelerated and you have them again here. So this was a situation where we had cold plasma and at the same time we identified this jet reversal. You can see here the velocity in the set direction, so first where the plasma is being ejected in the minus set direction and then in the plus z. This meant
Any other question? Well, if that's not the case, let's thank uh, Sergio again. Thank you all for coming.